He's authored over 30 books. This is a fellow who can read uh, cuneiform. This is a fellow who can read Hebrew. This is a fellow who can do a whole lot of different things. And he brings them to bear tonight on a really important question. If you'll join me in welcoming Trimper Longman. Let me say that one of the reasons why I've written 30 books over the past number of years is because I determined never to use PowerPoint because it would take too long for me to learn. I think I wrote about three books in the time that it would take me to learn PowerPoint, <laughs> which is, I'm glad that you all get to sit where the PowerPoint would be. And secondly, uh, I'll draw your attention uh, from time to time to the outline that I've given you. And let me say that Alice and I uh, have been praying daily for all of you here in Houston as we've anticipated coming down here. And toward the end, I'll maybe make a comment. I was asked something along the lines of divine violence and all the hurricanes that have been happening lately, and if we can say anything about that. So I'll probably conclude with a comment about that. But let me say that, you know, I've been interested in this topic before it became I would say trendy and controversial. Um, I wrote early articles on divine violence in the early 80s. I've given some academic lectures. I co-authored a book called God is a Warrior in 1995. And, and I kid you not that very few people were really interested in this topic until 9-11. So when 9-11 happened, and we started hearing people like Osama bin Laden and others talking in language that sounded reminiscent to uh, what you read in the Old Testament, all of a sudden, uh, people uh, started asking questions about the Old Testament in this regard. And I also should say that right now, my primary project that I'm writing is on controversial issues in the Old Testament, including creation, evolution, divine violence, historicity issues, and sexuality issues. Yes, I am retired, and so I can write <laughs> on those topics. Uh, but, <laughs> but, one <laughs> but one of the reasons uh, why I've chosen those particular topics isn't to, as some people should and do, address, say, for instance, the new atheists on this issue of divine violence. And many of you know that people like Richard Dawkins and others have pilloried the Bible on this subject. It's, it's my opinion that there's very little that we can say that would convince Richard Dawkins. I'm actually addressing uh, some of my evangelical colleagues and friends who themselves have been kind of reconsidering this issue and providing alternative interpretations. And I'm going to, in particular, uh, comment, ironically and respectfully, per to uh, a recent book, a very recent book by Gregory Boyd called... Uh, the Crucifixion of the Warrior God. I may have a word to say about Paul Copen's book, Is God a Moral Monster?, which I have much more appreciation for, uh, though I don't totally agree with the tack that he takes either. But let me begin, and if you would turn with me to the second page of your handout. Let me begin simply by pointing out just how pervasive the topic of divine violence is in the Old Testament. We're going to come to the New Testament a little bit later, but we're going to start in the Old Testament. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list of places in the Old Testament where 
you would see divine violence. It's a sort of a survey. But I start with a reference to the flood, Genesis 6 through 9, where God is described as sending a flood to destroy sinful humanity with the exception of Noah and his family. And then, you know, think of the, the crossing of the sea in Exodus 14 and 15. This is actually the first place God is explicitly called a warrior, an ish milchama in Hebrew. And I'll read this passage. It says, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. And of course, the one place that most people think about when we talk about this topic is the conquest described in Joshua 1 through 12. And I'm going to be reading in a moment Deuteronomy 20, uh, which is God's command through Moses to, uh, to the later generation that will enter into the promised land. But, but many of you, of course, all of you probably know the story of Jericho, where uh, the Israelites uh, march around the city seven times, or seven days, and on the seventh day, the walls fall. And it goes on to describe how then Israel goes in and annihilates all the inhabitants of Jericho. And of course, there are many other battles that follow that. If you come to the period of Judges, of course, this is a period of moral depravity, spiritual confusion, and political fragmentation. And so when Israel sins, um, God turns them over to an oppressor, and then after a while, the people uh, cry out to the Lord, which I take as a sign of repentance. God then raises up a judge who typically violently delivers um, Israel from the oppressor. And I put on uh, your handout here a section from Judges chapter 5, which celebrates Deborah's victory over the Midianites. When you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. Kings came, they fought. The kings of Canaan fought. At Ta'anak, by the waters of Megiddo, they took no plunder or silver, of silver. From the heavens, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away. The age-old river, the river Kishon. And then, during the period of the monarchy, we, on, when the kings are faithful to God, we'll see that the divine warrior comes to their support. In a place like 2 Samuel 5, 23 to 24, notice the instructions that David receives before he goes to battle against the Philistines. Do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. And, and you can read the rest of these on their own. So, uh, I give an example from the prophets, from Jeremiah 21, 3 through 7, and we could find many others. Uh, and the poets. Um, the Psalms are replete with warfare language. Now, for reasons that we'll come to understand later, we as Christian readers quickly spiritualize that language. But you need to understand that in the Old Testament context, these psalms, and I did an early study on this, 49 out of the 150 psalms found their original setting within the context of warfare in ancient Israel. These psalms are set within the physical battles of Israel. 
and even the wisdom literature. Uh, think of what Job says. He says, God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he burst upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. Now, some people might say, well, Job just misunderstands. It's really Satan, the devil. But those readers don't understand that the Satan is really the accuser who is one of God's angelic emissaries. And so God has given permission to this accuser to go out and harm Job. Matter of fact, to, to make a long story short, there's only two books, as far as I can determine, that, does it, that don't talk about God as a warrior in the Old Testament. One is the book of Ecclesiastes, and the other one's the Song of Songs. Uh, which, by the way, even though it doesn't talk about God as a warrior, uses martial imagery to describe the man's feeling toward the woman. So you even find military language there. Okay, so um, I think I've given you a sense of the fact that the theme of God as a warrior and the issue of divine violence is pervasive through the, um, through the Old Testament. Now, as I said... There are some recent modern evangelical reactions, and I just simply briefly describe two of them. Uh, they represent basically two different strategies that, as I say, I disagree with, um, though Copen less than Boyd. Uh, though I understand, by the way, I'm, <laughs> I'm perfectly sympathetic to the concerns that lead to their viewpoints, and I certainly would never suggest that somehow they're out of bounds for trying to grapple with this issue, though I am uh, somewhat troubled by Boyd's perspective on Scripture. Uh, but uh, Paul Copen, his strategy is to read these materials in as, I shall I put it this way, as positive a light as possible. He certainly fully affirms the authority and reliability of Scripture as it describes God, uh, but he works very hard to kind of, shall I put it this way, minimize the damage. Um, for instance, just some of his conclusions on page 184 of his book, he says, the language of the consecrated band, the harem, includes stereotypical language, all young and old and men and women. In other words, he says, God didn't really command the killing of women. It's just stereotypical language. And I just am unconvinced that that is the case. And he says, as far as we can see, the biblical harem, this word harem, by the way, is the word that is often translated ban or com in the verbal form to completely annihilate. And it means essentially that all the plunder is turned over to the Lord, not kept for personal use, and that uh, Israel is to execute all the inhabitants of the city. And as I say, this is extremely difficult for us to deal with, particularly as modern 21st century Western Christians. But he says, as far as we could see, biblical harem was carried out in particular, in particular military or combatant settings with cities and military kings. It turns out that the sweeping language of the ban is directed at combatants, and I, I'm not convinced of that. And also, just to pick one more example, the biblical text, according to some scholars, suggests the peace treaties, that peace treaties could be made with Canaanite cities if they chose to, but none except Gibeon did so. And again, I just don't see the evidence for that in the biblical text. I mean, the Gibeonites deceived Israel in order to get this treaty. It wasn't like there was this offer out there. And when I read Deuteronomy 20 in a moment, you'll see that actually for cities within the land, that offer was not suggested. Um, so, so I, while I appreciate, and, and there are many things in, in uh, Paul's uh, book that I, I do agree with, but I don't think he's um, 
really solve the problem. And because the problem is if one woman dies, if one young child dies, uh, you still have the ethical issue, even if, the, even if uh, the damage is minimized, as I put it. But as I say, I'm, I'm more uh, critical um, of Greg Boyd's approach, and let me describe it to you to save you from reading all 1,500 pages of his two-volume book, <laughs> though I understand he's come out with an abridged version. Um, but Boyd believes that, he, he begins by saying that the God who's depicted in the Bible isn't always the actual God. And uh, in other words, sometimes the Bible describes gods in ways that don't fit with who he really is. Now, you might say, well, how can you tell that? And he has an answer to that. He says, Jesus Christ is the fullest representation of God. And so, and in particular, and this is important for his argument for reasons I'll point out in just a moment, it's the crucified Jesus who is the most full representation of who God is. So anything, any description of God in the Bible that does not live up to that standard is therefore not a true depiction of God and therefore is to be rejected. Now he works really hard to bring some kind of relevance even out of those passages. But if he can't, then, and this is the most troubling part to me, he, he uh, suggests that, uh, that the biblical authors, including Moses, uh, sometimes write out of, and he, these are his words, their depraved and culturally conditioned perspective. And so, um, so he, it's not as if he doesn't think there's some measure of judgment. He just thinks that God himself doesn't directly apply it to people. And that's where this term divine Aikido, the way of peace, comes in. That, and the next point that I make, that he sees God not exercising violence directly, but withdrawing and letting evil people bring punishment toward other evil people. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so that's a general overview of his position. And I list some problems I have with that at the bottom of the page, beginning with a limited view of Christ. And, uh, because remember, he says it's the crucified Christ. Uh, what about, though, the Christ in the apocalyptic portions of the Bible? In Mark 13, which describes Jesus coming back again, riding a cloud, which is ancient Near Eastern imagery for the storm god, riding his chariot into battle. Uh, what about uh, the book of Revelation? I'm going to hold off illustrating that because that'll be part of my more positive presentation. So, um, secondly, uh, I've already mentioned his problematic view of Scripture. Uh, but let me also say that there are some tendentious interpretations. He doesn't want to play the, the biblical author is depraved and morally corrupt perspective, which he also does for the New Testament, for instance, when he can't make something work with his conception of who God actually is. He always plays that card. But say, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, uh, the angels who, I mean, if you read through any translation, there are angels who bring various forms of judgment from God on people. He turns those angels into demons who God restrains their efforts. But um, so there's some tendentious interpretations. Number four, I find a lack of appreciation for the coherence of the biblical method. In other words, a lot of what he's saying is, look, the picture we get of Jesus in the New Testament just doesn't conform to the picture in the Old Testament. And this feeds into the stereotypes that many people have, that in the Old Testament, God is wrathful. In the New Testament, God is a God of peace, as if God had like ang anger management counseling between the Old and New Testaments, you know. So, uh, so um, 
but my response to that will be what I present in just a moment as my positive view again, where I believe the biblical picture is coherent throughout the Old and New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation. And then, finally, as I'm reading through the book, uh, and perhaps we all do this from time to time, I see him approaching this subject as a problem to be solved rather than looking at the text as a uh, God's revelation to be understood. You see what I mean? In other words, he comes with the, what strikes me as I read him, and this is true also of Eric Siebert in his book, Disturbing Divine Behavior, and my good friend Peter Enns, the Bible told me so, i critical of that too, that, that they come with the pre-understanding of what God, who God is, and then they want to make the Bible say what they think God is in their conception. Okay, so... Um, now, let's turn to a more positive precedent. What's my view on this issue as it plays out in Scripture? And the way I'm going to approach this is, first of all, to describe the nature of warfare uh, in the Bible. And I'm going to do that by talking about what took place before, during, and after a battle. And then after I do that, I'm going to do what I would call a biblical theology of warfare, talking about how warfare unfolds from Genesis to Revelation. And my point will be that this is one, as I say, coherent story of God's battle and ultimate victory against evil. Now, um, as we look at the nature of warfare, I'm going to synthesize material from the laws of warfare in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7 and 20, as well as historical descriptions of warfare in the various following Old Testament books. <clears throat> and I'll give examples. But let me start by reading Deuteronomy 20. It's a little long, uh, and this is where PowerPoint would come in handy, so uh, since many of you don't have Bibles, but I'm sure you'll be listening attentively. My wife told me to read the Bible passages more slowly than I did in Lubbock, uh, so I will try to do that. It says, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them, because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. When you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. He shall say, Hear, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. The officers shall say to the army, Has anyone built a new house and not yet begun to live in it? Let him go home, or he may die in battle, and someone else may begin to live in it. Has anyone planted a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else marry her. Then the officer shall add, Is anyone afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home, so that his fellow soldiers will not become disheartened too. When the officers have finished speaking to the army, they shall appoint commanders over it. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put, it, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. And you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. 
However, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. That's our verb from the noun cherem. The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. As the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods. And you will sin against the Lord your God. When you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them, because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down. Are the trees people that you should besiege them? However, you may cut down trees that you know are not fruit trees and use them to build siege works until the city at war with you falls. Whoever said, the Bible's not green, okay? <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, with that background, um, let me talk about what takes place before a battle. And this first point is extremely important to my theological and ethical reflections later. It begins with what I call inquiry. But what I really mean is that Israel was not permitted to make decisions about going into war themselves. They had to be explicitly told that God wanted them to go to war. Now, just two examples of how that happens. Remember at the end of Joshua chapter 5, before the battle of Jericho, when Joshua is reconnoitering the area and he encounters what looks like a warrior and he says, are you for us or are you for our enemy? And this figure says, lo. No. In other words, he says, neither. I am uh, the commander of the Lord's host. And it turns out to be none other than God himself, because then the command comes, take off your sandals for you are on holy ground. And we presume that God gives Joshua there his literal marching orders. Um, in 1 Samuel 23, 1 through 6, we have a very interesting passage where David uh, knows about a situation to the south in a Judean city called Kila. He knows the Philistines have attacked this Judean city. Now, David is not the king yet. He's been anointed by Samuel. Uh, yeah, he's been anointed by Samuel, uh, but Saul's still king. And, and this is when David is kind of a king in exile or a future king in exile. Saul's trying to kill him. But he has an army, and he... Um, he has the accoutrements of the government with him. And, but he doesn't make a decision on his own, but rather he inquires of the Lord. And indeed, he inquires twice because his leaders are skeptical about it. And uh, then in verse 6, it says, Now Abiathar the high priest was with him. And it's interesting. It looks like a kind of, why, why do we care about that? Well, Abiathar, you see, as a high priest, had the Urim and Thummim, which were oracular devices where you could pose a question. David would say something like, should we go to war against the Philistines at Kila? The Urim and Thummim would be cast, and the answer came up yes. Now, the answer could come up no. What keeps these Urim and Thummim from being kind of magical dice is the fact that it could also come up no answer, as Saul found out at the end of his life. This isn't divination because it preserves God's freedom not to answer. But in this case, God does answer, and he goes down to fight the Philistines at Kila. Now, if God says yes, then the next step is spiritual preparation, which is very interesting because the soldiers need to be as spiritually prepared to go to battle as they would be to go to the holy place, whether the tabernacle or the later temple. And that's because God is, makes his special presence known on the battlefield, and that's usually symbolized by, especially in early Israelite history, by taking the Ark of the Covenant on the battlefield, which is the most potent symbol 
of God's presence during this time period. And so this helps explain a lot that you read about in the historical books. For instance, before the Battle of Jericho, isn't it odd that all the men undergo a mass circumcision? All you have to do is read Genesis 34 about how Levi and Simeon, uh, you know, massacred a whole city because he duped them into being circumcised. I don't have to tell the guys out there that this would be debilitating. But it was more dangerous to go to battle uncircumcised than to undergo this mass circumcision within bowshot of Jericho. Here's another one you might think about that perhaps um, what I'm saying draws a little bit of perspective on 1 Samuel 11. 1 Samuel 11 begins, uh, In the spring when kings go out to war, David is on his roof. That's an immediate criticism, of course. And of course, then he sees Bathsheba. He ends up sleeping with her. Uh, she becomes pregnant. And so now David's thinking, how can I cover this up? And, of course, he calls Uriah back from the front line and on the pretense that he'll give David a report on the battle. And then he dismisses him, and David thinks he's going to go sleep with Bathsheba. And eight and a half months later, when the baby comes a little early, uh, it'll be good that he looks a little bit like his great king. But, um, but you know what happens. He sleeps on the threshold, and when David comes back and asks him why... Um, Uriah responds, How could I sleep with my wife when Joab, my commander, and the Ark of the Covenant are on the plains of Yabesh Gilead? And what Uriah is saying to David is, How could I sleep with my wife, have an omission of semen, render myself ritually unclean for a short period of time, so I am unable to go onto the battlefield? He's not saying, how could I have fun when my buddies are out there? It's a ritual uh, cleanliness issue. And, uh, and it really draws a contrast, of course, between Uriah the what? Uriah the Hittite. He's not even a native Israelite. He certainly is a Yahweh worshiper, and more about that later, the presence of non-Israelites among the Israelites. He's observing what we shall call the details of the law when David, the anointed king, is breaking the big ones. You know, you must not commit adultery. You must not murder. So, um, so, so spiritual preparation, which includes the offering of sacrifices. And if you go back and read 1 Samuel 13, you'll see, and this is interesting in the light of what we read in Deuteronomy 20, uh, Saul's ready to go to battle against the Philistines. But Samuel is late coming to offer the pre-battle sacrifices. Sam, uh, Saul's troops are beginning to desert. They're growing afraid and they're deserting. And, uh, and so Saul offers the sacrifice. Samuel shows up late and he's upset. So upset that he announces that Saul will not have a son to succeed him on the throne. Now, you kind of feel sorry for Saul. I mean, come on, Samuel, show up on time. Uh, but remember what we read in Deuteronomy 20. Not only should Saul not have been worried about the desertion of some of his troops because they were afraid, he should have been out there advocating for it. Are, are you afraid? Oh, you are? Well, go home. We don't need you anyway. Indeed, <laughs> That's the point, and now we, well, first of all, just a brief word about the march into battle. I'll just simply mention that the march into battle, uh, when you read, when you have the description of them, it reads like a religious procession. And uh, the Second Chronicles 20 passage is Jehoshaphat and his army going into battle. They're singing hymns. They're praising God. I mentioned... Um, Numbers 10 here, which is kind of interesting, um, because, you see, if you read the book of Numbers carefully, you'll see that the book of Numbers is presenting the wilderness wandering, not as a bunch of ragtag people kind of stumbling through the wilderness blindly, but actually as an army on the march. 
Uh, Numbers chapter 1 gives a, uh, well, some people call it a census. It just numbers men over 20 prepared for war. It's really a military registration. And then if you read Numbers 10, 35, and 36, you'll see that whenever they begin the march, Moses announces, rise up, O Lord, and scatter the countless enemies of Israel. And at that point, the priests take the ark out of the uh, tabernacle, and they lead the march. So it's, it's Numbers conceives of the wilderness wanderings as an army on the march. But now we come to, during the battle, a couple things to highlight. Um, and that is, again, I've kind of hinted at this, but let me be explicit. The numbers of troops and the quality of weapons don't matter. Well, they do matter in the sense that you shouldn't go into the battle with a superior fighting force. And of course, the, the story of Gideon against the Midianites illustrates that well. Uh, 32,000 troops show up to support Gideon. Praise God, except God says, you have way too many troops. Get rid of them. And, and so Gideon goes through, anybody who's afraid, go home, etc., etc. He still has like 10,000. And God says, no, no, that's not going to do. Take him down to the Wadi Harod and have him drink water. So some of them get down on their knees and cup it up to their mouth. And some get down like uh, on their stomachs and lap it like dogs, they say. And actually, the Hebrew is a little ambiguous, but it seems that God chooses 300 dog lappers. <laughs> And you see some of these 19th century commentators going, now the dog lappers are very wise and staying low below. No, that's not it. God's just trying to get rid of them to go into battle in an inferior position so that, um, so that when they win the battle, they don't say, it's because of our strength, but rather it's because of the strength of the Lord. And just real quickly, think about the story of David and Goliath as being a good example of this, where in 1 Samuel 17, uh, we're introduced to Goliath. Goliath, the mega warrior. Um, and he is given what I think is the longest sort of physical description in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew narrator is very uh, reticent about giving descriptions of people. Whenever they do, it's very extremely important to the story. It talks about the, his size, his armor, his weaponry. And then in the other corner, we have David. David, who's just shown up to deliver lunch to his brothers. So he goes out and confronts Goliath with a slingshot. And, um, and before he throws the stone, he gives a speech. And the reason why I want to read this speech is I think it's the most uh, clear articulation of what I would call warrior theology in the Old Testament. David says to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Now, I want you to notice something here, because I do think these warfares, in this, and including this one, this individual battle, is illustrative of a very important theological principle of the relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. You know, we have theologians among us who so emphasize divine sovereignty, it almost does away with human responsibility, and others who so emphasize human responsibility that it does away with divine sovereignty. But here we see David engaging Goliath. You know, this could have gone down a completely different way. God very easily could have said to David, hey, David, 
go out on the battlefield, make that speech, back up 100 yards, because I'm going to fry that guy with a lightning bolt. <laughs> no, David has to engage the battle. He has to be involved in it. So I think, you know, let theologians figure out how to co you know, how to make divine sovereignty and human responsibility work. I think we should just affirm both parts of that. After all, doesn't Paul say in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who saves us. Okay, so um, real quickly, um, though it is kind of the nub of the controversy, uh, first of all, what takes place after the battle? First of all, praise. I've already talked about how so many Psalms in Exodus 15, Judges 5, celebrate the victory that God gives his people. And then also the disturbing part, which I've already described, of battles within the land, which includes the harem. Okay, with that background, we now will do a survey, Genesis through Revelation, don't worry. I can summarize these five phases very concisely. Um, because I, I, as I read the biblical material, I have found that it's helpful to describe what's going on from Genesis to Revelation under five phases. The first phase describes those accounts where God fights the flesh and blood enemies of Israel, who are also his enemies. And I don't have to spend any time on this because this is really what we've been talking about, and I've been giving examples of this. But we should also be aware that Israel, it's not Israel right or wrong, that we also have a number of stories about how God fights Israel. When Israel is disobedient, that's important, God will fight against them. Right after the Battle of Jericho comes the Battle of Ai. Ai in Hebrew means trash heap, dump, ruin. So they're going to battle after they fight Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. They go to fight Dump City and lose. Why? Because they have been disobedient in the person of Achan who has stolen some of the plunder, which is a violation of the harem. After he's executed, and by the way, he illustrates that an Israelite through his disobedience, becomes essentially a Canaanite and has the fate of a Canaanite, whereas Rahab is illustrative, and I think Rahab's just an illustration of a Canaanite who acts like an Israelite, and so she's invited into the covenant community. And this is not a one-off thing as we can tell from the many non-Israelite names like Uriah the Hittite, Shamgar, and many others, um, which, let me just comment now, kind of undermines the whole idea that this is some kind of ethnic cleansing. It is a sin cleansing. It's not an ethnic cleansing. Okay, so... Um, so phase one and phase two, um, there are other examples I give there. Uh, read Lamentations 2, uh, and you'll see that the poet is responding to the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians, so the Babylonians aren't mentioned. Why aren't the Babylonians mentioned? Because the poet understands that the city has fallen because God has come against them, and this is the phrase that recurs throughout Lamentations 2, as an enemy. Okay, now phase 3. Phase 2 doesn't end the Old Testament story. In phase 3, we uh, have exilic and post-exilic prophets. Daniel, Zechariah, Malachi being good examples, who have a message about the future. And that message about the future is, you are under the hand of an evil oppressor now, but God, your warrior, will come and save you from that oppressor. You know Dan, the story of Daniel 7, the picture of successive oppressive nations pictured as monstrous animals arising out of a chaotic sea. 
but the one like the Son of Man riding the cloud into the presence of the Ancient of Days defeats those oppressive uh, nations. This is the note on which the Old Testament ends. So with that in mind, let's turn to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Give me just a sec. Here we read about John the Baptist, the first voice that we hear uh, that initiates the ministry of Jesus. Listen closely to what he says in verses 7 and following. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you could say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus comes, John recognizes him as the one, baptizes him. John goes into jail. Jesus goes out and begins his ministry. John hears reports. Jesus is out there healing the sick, exercising demons, and preaching the good news to the poor. And in Matthew chapter 11, we come to understand that as John hears this report, these reports, he's responding by the, by say, by thinking, I might have baptized the wrong guy, okay? <laughs> because there we read that John sends two disciples to Jesus with the question, are you the one or should we expect another? In other words, Jesus, where's the ax chopping? Where's the chaff burning? Now, Jesus responds by saying, by going out and doing more of the same, saying, go back and tell John what to say. So what message is Jesus saying to John? He's saying, John, I am the divine warrior, but I have heightened and intensified the battle so that it's directed not toward flesh and blood, but toward the spiritual powers and authority. And John you can't defeat these enemies by killing, but rather by dying. Now, of course, I'm reading back a lot of later scripture passages, including what we read at the time of Jesus' arrest, when Peter whips out his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. After putting the ear back on, which I think is ultimately cool, uh, Jesus then says, Peter, uh, put away your sword. If I wanted to, I could have myriads of my father's heavenly army here, but my way is to the cross. And, by the way, I'm talking about phase four here. Um, not only that, when we read Paul, we'll see that he'll often refer back to the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension and use military language. Now, I'll just give one example from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authority, and it's particularly verse 15, having disarmed, notice the martial language, the powers and authority, he made a public spectacle of them, a kind of reference to the post-battle parade, 
triumphing over them by the cross. Theologians call this the deus victor model of the atonement. Um, was John the Baptist wrong? My response to that is no. Um, but John is like a prophet. He doesn't understand the full import of his words. He doesn't realize that Jesus is coming not once, but twice. And therefore, we come to phase five, where the final victory takes place. And, um, and again, I want to illustrate phase five by simply reading Revelation chapter 19, 11 and following. where it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. And let me just pause to quickly say, this passage is derived from micro-allusions and quotations from Psalms, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, all of which refer to Yahweh as the warrior, now being applied to Christ. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their army gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Let me just say, after reading that passage, that you simply cannot make a distinction between Old Testament talking about a wrathful God and the New Testament talking about a God of peace. Both the Old Testament talks about a God of peace and a God of wrath, and so does the New Testament. Well, let me conclude now with just a few reflections on what we've just seen. First of all, I would suggest to you that this is a coherent picture of God's battle against evil that begins in Genesis and ends in Revelation. And I would also suggest to you, and here I'm using language derived from one of my teachers, Meredith Klein, that what we have in the Old Testament, and let's take the conquest as an example, is an intrusion of follow me closely here, end time ethics where the wicked are punished and the uh, righteous are redeemed, saved, uh, into the period of common grace where typically the righteous and the wicked are, are intermingled. It's not the division yet between the sheep and the goats. So I consider what we read in the Old Testament as a preview and warning of what will happen at the consummation. In other words, we're dealing here with the issue of judgment. And remember, there's a very interesting passage in Genesis 15 where God is saying to Abraham, now, you're going to have this land, but not yet, because the sin of the Amorites, which is another term for the Canaanites, is not yet full. Um, what we're dealing with here, I believe, is an issue of justice. Uh, we have a lot of concern, rightly so, for justice these days. But justice doesn't come easily. 
And uh, here I would appeal, and I have a longer quote, which I'm not going to do because I've already gone over the time I told Mark I would take. Uh, but uh, but I, would, I would cite the work of Miroslav Volf, who is a theologian at Yale, who's Croatian himself. And, um, and as he changed his view on the idea of judgment, uh, as he saw his Croatian people being so horribly abused by Serbs, and I'm sure there were atrocities the other way, but he said to not have judgment would violate justice because it would enthrone violence because it would leave the violator unchanged and the consequences of violence unremedied. Well, let me just share something here. One of the, I think, anxieties we have about this is going out there and talking to non-Christians about the Bible and them coming back to us and talking about this wrathful judging God. Well, let me briefly share with you my conversion story. <laughs> when I was in high school, a uh, girl I was interested in, sorry, Alice, but uh, it was before I met you, um, gave me a copy, and some of you older people will remember, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Okay, now I do not accept his interpretation of the text, but he got one thing right in there, and that is the idea that God is going to come back and judge sinners. And I knew I was a sinner. So, to put it kind of bluntly, understanding the judgment drew me to God. <laughs> and uh, and so, so, actually, this is an evangelism tool. All right. As, of course... Uh, Jonathan Edwards understood, too, as he talked about, uh, uh, as he preached. Let me be clear, though, as I conclude, that we live in phase four. And we must always remember we live in phase four, the period of spiritual warfare. The use of violence to further the interests of the gospel in any way, or to fight to harm physically harm anybody uh, in defense of the church or our values is sinful. People will often bring up the Crusades. That was sinful. Shooting abortion doctors, sinful. Any use of violence to further the interests of the church or the gospel is sinful. Uh, by the way, just aside, I'm not a pacifist. Um, I think there is an argument, a biblical argument, to be made that Christians can be in the military, but that's different than what I'm talking about here. Um, so, so we always need to bear that in mind. Our battle is spiritual. Our battle mandate is found in passages like Ephesians 6, 10 and following. Put on the whole armor of God. And there we notice that our weapons are not swords and spears, but rather prayer and faith, and so forth. Indeed, God calls us to go out and bring people to him. But notice that in Colossians chapter 2, it uses the language of death and life. Um, when somebody becomes a Christian, they move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And Colossians 2.12 describes this as being buried in baptism. Also, we have a warfare going on not only out there, but in our own hearts. Notice Romans 7 and other passages that describe our struggle against sin as a battle, as a war. And so um, we need to keep that in mind. Okay, let me just conclude, since I told you I would, uh, with a comment about... about uh, about, um, you know, divine violence and natural disasters like the hurricane you all experienced. Um, now, to be honest, I haven't heard, and there probably are, I haven't heard Christian leaders talking about the hurricane against Houston as an act of divine violence. Uh, I guess there are too many Christians in Houston. Uh, but, but apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal, there are some who think it's some kind of recompense for 
fossil fuels. Uh, they're not Christians. So let me remind you what uh, one prominent Christian leader said about Katrina. And that was that it was a act of divine violence against a sinful city. And he didn't read the map too closely, right? Steve, Steve Ortiz was in New Orleans at the time, teaching at New Orleans Baptist, which was under the flood water. Uh, and as I understand, it was the part of New Orleans that had the largest percentage of Christians that got the flood, leaving the French Quarter high and dry. So uh, <laughs> my point is, my point is, we should never try to read God's providence in that way. And it's certainly not the case that all suffering is a result of sin. Read the book of Job. Um, so I'll conclude with that, offering those few reflections on this important topic. And thank you so much for your attention. All right, as Christians, we realize our God is the true God. What would you say to a secularist hmm. who wonders how biblical divine violence is any different than Islamic divine violence or jihad? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I would say that, um, as I was saying, I was addressing Christians who accept the Bible as God's revelation to them. And so a non-Christian is going to struggle with an issue like that. Um, and one of the things I would point out is that the Old Testament has the New Testament that turns the uh, physical warfares of Israel into the spiritual warfare of Israel, which is something the Quran doesn't have, though there are some authoritative interpretations that make that move that Osama bin Laden obviously doesn't accept. Um, and so, um, well, at least comparing contemporary Christian ethics with Islamic ethics, at least among jihadists, uh, there's a world of difference there. But it, it boils down to something that they won't accept, in my mind, uh, and that is that we understand that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is the true God. And we don't believe that Allah is. And so it boils down to other issues, I think, of apologetics and evangelism rather than... Because um, it is true that the Quran derives a lot of its theology out of the Old Testament. So essentially, when we come to that level of the discussion, I turn it over to apologists like Mark Lanier and <laughs> Paul Copen and others. All right. Does the amount of usage of harem, harem in the Bible say anything about how much prep is put into it? Or is the act of harem used a lot and just the word isn't? Hmm. Well, um, th that's a great question. And it's, uh, the term harem doesn't occur all that often. Remember that it's connected not to all warfare in the Old Testament, but specifically to warfare within the land. And even there, there's a case to be made that uh, harem doesn't necessarily involve the death of Canaanites. Uh, there's some good evidence that, you know, as I said, some Canaanites came over to the Israelite side, and also that some Canaanites fled. It wasn't as if the Israelites were commissioned to go after them and to kill them in some land of refuge or anything like that. But um, the term, and, and this is something that Paul Copan uh, points out that I agree with, it's really a something that's restricted in time and restricted in scope. Does that get at that question, you think? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay, um, would you agree that wisdom can be characterized as the mind of God? And does the fear of God serve as a guide for humanity in facilitating it and living a godly life? 
Okay, uh, could you give me that one more time? Yeah, Would, why don't we break it apart into two? Yes, good, thank you. Would you agree that wisdom, Kachma in yeah. Hebrew, can be characterized as the mind of God? I would say that, of course, God epitomizes and is the source of only of all true wisdom. Um, I'm not sure I would quite put it that wisdom is the mind of God, but certainly as God acts and as he speaks, it's a expression of his wisdom. Would you go, this is me pressing yes, the yes, question good, now, good, as yes. opposed to that, would you go so far as to say that wisdom in this sense, whether it's the Old Testament Chachmah or Sophia in the New yeah, Testament, that right. wisdom, Sophos, uh, that wisdom is um, seeing things in the world from a godly perspective. Oh, yes, yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. And, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom uh, is communicating that to us because when, and it's contrasted with being wise in your own eyes. So yeah, definitely. There is an argument that the Hebrew people used God, in quotation marks, as an excuse to annihilate their enemies. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that is that that would involve a rejection of what I think is divine revelation in the Bible. We might understand that if we were just looking at things on the ground, but we have God's own self-revelation, which is interpreting his divine acts in the land. The next question uh, says, may Christians pray in an imprecatory manner? Ah, yeah. If so, how and about whom? And I, it'd be useful to make sure everybody knows the imprecatory psalms are the ones that say, you know, happy will be the one who dashes your baby on the rocks. That would at least be a verse of one. Yeah, and things yeah, like right. that. Yeah, that's, right. That's, thanks for giving the most extreme example there. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> to make that's, it harder for me. That's but my job. here's a, <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but um, for many years, I thought that it was inappropriate for Christians to pray the imprecatory prayers. Uh, I was teaching in Australia maybe 15 years ago when I was making that case, and a young pastor came up to me and said, I'm sorry, Professor, I heartily disagree with you. If I didn't have the imprecatory prayers, I surely would have killed my wife, my former wife, and the man she ran away with. Then he explained how he brought this man into his home, and and uh, and how he uh, and how that man seduced his wife, and they ran off together. And he literally wanted to kill him, but he could pray the imprecatory psalms, which, if you read closely, isn't saying, "Lord, please give me the opportunity and the resources so I can kill that guy." What it's doing, it's saying, "Lord, you kill that guy." And you're turning your anger over to the Lord. And the point is that the Psalms express all the emotions that we feel, and we turn them over to God, and God chooses to kill that person. But, uh, but, you, but so that's how I feel about the imprecatory Psalms. All right. How would you explain the difference between the commandment, do not murder, uh -huh. And God commanding Israel to kill its enemies. Right. Another example of the Holy Spirit killing Ani Ananias yeah. and Sapphira. Right, by the way, that's a good example from the New Testament. Um, yeah, uh, I will simply say it's you must not murder. It's not you must not kill. The term is talking about the illegitimate taking of life. Obviously, in the case law that follows, there's the mention, in many cases, of capital punishment. Now, I think that that's a, uh, I, I think that's the maximum penalty. I don't think in all those cases, it, it, there's a passage in Numbers 35 which says, in the case of premeditated murder, it doesn't use that term, but I've got a lawyer next to me, um, <laughs> you must not substitute any lesser sentence, which means that, yeah, there's, and that passage and other passages suggested, but it's you must not murder, ratzak, 
and which is a more specialized term, I believe, even though it's in some passages it, uh, it has a broader meaning. So when God allows for or even commands the killing of another person, that's not murder. All right, um, we're, we're going to try and wrap this up in about six minutes. We may hit a lightning round in a moment. <laughs> Um, how is God's directed violence in the Old Testament different from Islamic Jihad? Um, well, it's different from the God who commands it. Uh, one a true God, one a false God. And so, um, again, that gets back to that earlier question. Um, so, it, but on a surface level, as I say, the Quran actually has is is somewhat derivative from the old testament on certain things like this so you'll find some similarities all right a couple of of uh questions that kind of seem to get at the root of many of the others what's the purpose of phases one through three why not start with phase four ah. um that i leave to the wisdom and mystery of god in one sense but um you know, I, 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 the, that question could actually be recalibrated to say, well, after Adam and Eve sinned, why didn't Jesus appear then? Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I can answer that question, uh, though there may be something, and I'm not certain about it, there may be something to the idea, and I see this clearly with certain things in the Old Testament like slavery and polygamy, where God takes the people where they are and kind of moves them in the right direction. Uh, so so that there might be something to say in that way. All right, lightning round. What version of the Bible do you use? Uh, many different versions of the Bible. I was a senior translator of the New Living Translation, so I... Uh, use that a lot. I use the NIV a lot. I was using the NIV tonight. Um, I, um, yeah, so, so there are a lot of different translations that I would very much affirm. Okay, that was a young person's writing, is my yeah, guess. Yeah, so yeah. if a young person's going to get a Bible, which kind would you tell them to get? I, I would honestly tell them to take the New Living Translation, not because I was very involved in it, but because it really, I think, uh, is very clear in its translation, though uh, accurate in terms of rendering it. The message, which I'm also a consultant for, and the 25th anniversary edition is going to appear, I think, next year, uh, which I like, but I think it ought to be used as a second translation. All right. At Jesus' birth, the heavenly hosts yes, right. shout the newborn king's entrance into the world. Since host is military, yeah. is this passage pointing to Jesus as a divine warrior king? Ah, yeah, I think uh, certainly hosts are God's heavenly army, the angelic army, uh, the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of the angelic armies. I hadn't thought about that, but I'd like to think about it more, but it's suggestive. Okay, here are the easy, quick ones. If you were President Trump's commander-in-chief, oh, how would no. you advocate persecuting the war against uh, radical Islam? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning round. Yeah, no, no, contender, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, how well, well, I will say this, that... Mm -hmm. It should never be characterized as a religious war. Ah, very good. Um, you said Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs are the only books that don't speak of God as a warrior. What about Esther? Oh, um, well, that's interesting, actually. I wish we had a half hour, but um, the hero of Esther, the one who saves the day, is the one who is... Uh, whose name is not spoken, and I don't mean Voldemort, okay? So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, in other words, it's God who delivers them through all those ironic reversals that take place, and everybody recognizes that. And by the way, Haman is an Agagite, which means he's an Amalekite, 
And Esther is a descendant of Saul, and therefore we have the completion of the story that began in Exodus 18, and Saul didn't do it in 1 Samuel 15, so it finally takes place in the book of Esther. Are you familiar with Dom Crossan's work on this? Uh, no. Me either. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, not I not a comment like on it, his probably. work. It may be brilliant. I just I probably don't wouldn't like it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know him. Oh. <laughs> no, sorry. You might be a fan. Um, how is your commentary on the Psalms different from every other commentary on the Psalms? Besides, it's great. No, uh, <laughs> no there, is a, there is a difference. There is a difference. And that difference is, uh, with one exception, it's the only commentary on the Psalms which gives a Christological reading of all 150 Psalms. And the other, only other exception is Zenger and Hosfeldt's Hermeneia commentary, which is virtually uh, so technical that you would never want to read it. <laughs> and the last two questions seem to kind of go together. Um, first of all, one person's offering to mosh with you. <laughs> and the, the other one says, please comment on the relationship between your lecture topic and mega death. <laughs> By the way, as I informed Mark over dinner, the lead singer of Megadeth, Dave Mustaine, is a fine Christian man who's <laughs> who apparently became a Christian through Alice Cooper, at least the room. But I do have a former <laughs> student at Westmont. I do have a former student at Westmont who teaches in a Christian school in Phoenix where he lives and had his kid in first grade about five years ago. And so... Um, Apparently, according to this former student, he asked his elementary school kid what he thought of his father, and it was basically, he's a little strange. But, uh, <laughs> but he plays the guitar really well. Yeah. Um, would y'all join me in thanking Tremper? <laughs> Thank you.